Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Emily Moyer. This is Strange Mosaic. My good buddy, Christopher Gardner, is here, and we are going to chat about what I have no idea, but that doesn't matter because we both have plenty to say all the time, no matter what. Christopher Gardner, welcome back. How are you doing, Emily? It's good to be back. Good. I'm nice to see you. You look suntanned and smiley and like you've been working, doing a hard day's work outside in the sun and it feels good or something. Now prove me wrong. Yeah, we had we had a little break in the weather today, so I was able to get outside and actually chop some wood. You know, I think like last year, we'll probably get one big push of cold again. So I want to make sure I had enough firewood ready. Gotcha. I think we just finished our last push of cold here, right? Like we we had like a faux sort of summer is here, 90 degree weekend a few weeks ago. And then mm -hmm. it dropped back down like into the low 50s and high 40s. Um, but I think... Uh, yesterday it like did the thing where it had been really cold the day before and then yesterday it was in the 70s and raining so it was like the thermal sauna kind of thing and yeah really the sign that that uh the warm weather is here and fairly here to stay so i for me i'm thankful because i don't like cold weather right yeah i thought that last year last march i had put all my my vegetables out in my little garden it was the first time i was you know, in the Ozarks and I was like, yay, I had all my starts and did it, did it all up. And then like, man, all of April, we got whacked with cold, wet weather and it like killed about two thirds of my garden. <laughs> we learn. So, we yeah. learn. so here, here, the locals say, do not, don't plant anything outside till May. Yeah. All right. That sounds that sounds like it's probably wise advice. Winter comes not too early in Missouri. So you have like the, right? What time right. does winter start? Not until like December there, right? November, December. It, it was nice. I mean, we bought we bought this place. So we've only been here since, when was it? October 21st. And even the first week we moved in, it was really gentle. Okay. Like uh, the winter this year over, uh, overall was like extremely mild. Like I felt like this winter all the big storms were induced. Yep. There was no, there was no natural winter. It was like, almost like it felt like if they weren't spraying and inducing some sort of cloud cover and, and trying to bring in weather, we would have had, you know, warmer days and, and almost like perfectly blue skies. Yeah. In, in the few months that I've been here, I've only seen probably about seven, eight days in, in total where that we've had like regular clouds all right. uh, other than that all the other clouds are all induced yeah it is interesting right like the like, you know i've lived in a variety of places but how you'll sometimes you'll go like months or i feel like in california i even went like years without seeing what i would classify as a real cloud mm -hmm. right which I, I i sometimes i'm like is there, do we even know what a real cloud is? Because they've probably been doing this shit longer than what we think. And so some of the things we think of as natural are just the older version of the technology that had developed, gotten rounder around the edges as things tend yeah. to when they get older. Right. So um, I don't know, but like, you know, sometimes we get these days here that where the sky looks like, remember how the sky looked in Super Mario Brothers with like yes. the perfect little clouds and things like that. It will mm -hmm. look like that. And I can't tell if like that's the real world or that's just like the best simulation ever. <laughs> right? Right. So, <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, no, it is really interesting to watch like the different the different styles of created sky and weather. Right. Like, yeah, you know, and so then you have to ask like, OK, like what is the purpose? Is it the same people if it's even people or the same technology that is creating these various kinds is it some sort of like you know turf war like the area in the sky is mm -hmm. it like a turf war like a corner in a neighborhood with drug sales or something like because you see so many different things so, so many weird things right? right but it's like well what would be the purpose of this one as opposed to that one because it doesn't always include an amount of precipitation or some extreme temperature thing on either end of it. It's just like, what is this? Like, you know, like trying to differ. My friend Sean got into like a variety of like ways of describing the different kinds of effects in the sky, right? Mm -hmm. He was doing 
So his YouTube channel, which is not really active anymore, but everything is still there, is Industrial Surrealism. And he's mm-hmm. known for the work known as Who, What is in Our Skies, where he was one of the first people to really get a lot of imagery of the what he calls cloud cloaked craft. Mm-hmm. Right. And as part of that, he started to develop like names. Remember when Dutch since started naming the patterns he saw in the sky, like there was the mm-hmm. crisscross and the stairs. So Sean was doing like a similar thing. And like he had ones that he called like the the rib cage or one that was like the wishbone or the stingray or the whatever, like, right. He had different, you know, different shapes. Cause you'd see these shapes over and over again. And like, mm-hmm. what is the connection between what it looks like in the sky and the effect of any that it has, or like, is there an effect having that we're not able to sense or tell or whatnot? And what is technology? What is, I mean, and he, you know, he got into everything. He was looking at, you know, military, alien, biblical things, like, are these like the oceans above kind of manta ray? You know, he got into everything. Uh, But it was interesting, because there was definitely like repeating patterns, right? That you And like, what is that particular one? What is causing that one? What is the effect they're going for? I've seen his videos before. I, I find your theory much more plausible Last time we talked, or it might have been one of the podcasts of yours I listened to, where you were talking about how essentially the the real free energy technology that's out there is essentially creating um, plasma fields through mm-hmm. coherent magnet arrays, magnetic arrays. And if they can spray metal salts, like I'm looking up into a perfectly corrugated cloud system right now. So if they can spray these metal salts and then they can essentially forge the metal salts through pulsing microwaves. And so they can essentially create a perfect array and then they can make it parabolic. Yep. And with that parabolic uh, uh, array of metal salts, you can get a plasmatic plasmatic lensing. Yeah. And I, there was none of his videos that I saw that if he, didn't put animations there that I would have projected onto it what he projected onto it Mm. I just have to be honest I wanted to because I'm a I'm a freak and I love everything like that but I had to say I was like uh there that's that's a lot of reaching because he was talking about areas of Louisiana that my family was from and he was like looking up and it's like "Mm." I I think he left he he left it with more questions than he had answers so he was just Basically, you know, he went through all these phases because he discovered it by accident, right? He was trying to take a picture of lightning in the sky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, what he would do is he would set up his camera to run and, you know, at a time when he thought that there was going to be the possibility of there being lightning or a storm in the sky, right? Because he was an artist, he was a photographer. And, when he thought it was going to come, it wouldn't come. And so he was like, what is happening? And so he started to observe and notice things and then go from there. And I think part of the reason that he stopped, right. Was like, he, you know, was not, uh, he, he, by the end, he was more confused I think, than he was sort of in the mm-hmm. beginning. I don't think he would tell you he knows for sure what it is, just ideas he was playing with. But I, because I followed from the beginning and I watched sort of his progression, I saw how he came to the conclusion that what was inside was inside and why he would make those animations like that. Mm-hmm. And, and and he did it from sort of the beginning with using stuff on his camera because he was a photographer to, uh, I don't know what the technical terms are, but like pull things out and highlight things. And inside of the clouds that had his attention, there was always the same geometric structure, right? Mm -hmm. So then he went looking to see if there were things that could be explained that matched said shape and whatnot. And, you know, he tossed around a bunch of different ideas. I don't know. I haven't talked to him in a while. I don't know where he stands with that stuff Mm -hmm. today, Um, but he certainly observed some very strange phenomena that I'm not satisfied has been explained by anyone or anything at all. Right. Yeah. But I don't think I, he thinks he has an answer. I wouldn't say he thinks he has a, a an answer or a solution or anything like that. My personal bias is away from the materialist perspective. 
and it's much more like you were saying earlier into like the holographic nature of things yep like i really think this the the environment that we're in is extremely uh interactive the observer effect is a is a real thing and the higher up you go the more etheric it is so depending on your mind force depending on your capacity to imagine, your capacity to project, your your capacity to connect to your the higher beings that are you know involved in your experience. Um, I think you could have a whole myriad of different interactions. I I I watched this one video years ago about these guys praying away chemtrails, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, this is some bullshit. <laughs> and I was like, there's no way, you know, because I was like my my projection at that point was that this is all material, material, material. And I read their thing on their website and they're like, yeah, these are demonic entities. The majority of them, they, they, they pretend to be X, Y, Z, this, this, and that. And at the time that I was reading that, I didn't really understand um, the POV and the arc Mm-hmm. of distance that we can see which <laughs> if anything proves how much of a holographic reality this is <laughs> so you had these guys with cameras that were zooming in and out and they're like there's no way that that could be thirty five thousand feet up in the air and you know doing all these measurements and things like that and who knows i don't know how camera technology works i don't know uh you know, if you're having a digital zoom versus an actual physical zoom, mm-hmm. all that aside, I experimented with praying away chemtrails, like actually asking the higher beings in, in my existence to, I gave them authority and I gave them dominion to clear the skies. The first time I did it, I had a lot of doubt in me. So that, of course, that's what I experienced. But then I remembered all these times I had been in ayahuasca journeys. um, The shamans I was with, whatever weather we had, the weather would reverse. Mm -hmm. By the time the first cup hit everybody, (laughs) if it was perfectly clear out, clouds would come in. If it was perfectly rainy, the clouds would go away. Like it was always the inverse of whatever the field was. And, um, and then I, I remembered all these times I was with the stars, with the luminaries and just being with the luminaries and how they were interactive. And I was like, wait a minute, this, I think I know what's going on up there, but I don't. How about I just trust? (laughs) How about I just come from like a faith perspective and I gave authority to all the unseen helpers. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that that are around and man like i had this like loop current that occurred with the sun and then like there was this clearing that occurred and i was grounded like i had my feet were flat on the ground and it was just like whoa this is like a real thing and <clears throat> i've i've talked to tom barnett about it he's done it like i've talked to a few other people that i know that really know their their higher authority and there's something there's something to this realm it's if from our perspective it's material we experience it as material but i've been playing as of late with this notion of a of a of a dipolar hologram <laughs> have you ever have you ever looked into like how holograms work no, I, I, I want to hear about this, but real quickly, I just want to respond to what you were saying. So okay. I think the, um, whatever the fuck it is that we find ourselves living in is very responsive to imagination and interaction, mm-hmm. right? And so like, almost like the more stories I tell about what I see in front of my eyes, the crazier the things in front of my eye, eyes become. Like they start responding to that and like whatever the, the, whatever narrative I'm laying down, they start really actively becoming a participant in that. Right. Mm -hmm. So it starts with me just saying, oh, this looks like something, or I see, you know, like when you're little, I see a bunny in the clouds or I see whatever kind of thing. Right. But to the extent that you sort of are able to like 
focus on it and like make it convincing. Express your imagination in a little bit of an authoritative fashion. When I say authoritative, I don't mean like be firm with it, but just mm -hmm. like speak it into existence. And then it starts to happen. And then before you know it, it's like, you can't really tell whether you are, they're responding to what you're saying or whether they're generating something and you're talking about it, right? And it so becomes mm -hmm. this like interesting tennis match, this interesting, you know, like once in tennis, when they're having a, a really good rally, you know, once it gets to the play, point that like one player is dominating the rally and dictating the point, right? You see where it's going, but in these, some really good long rallies, there comes a part in the middle where it's like an even trade and you can't quite tell who's controlling the rally, right? Mm -hmm. And that's my favorite part of that. And it's fascinating to me how like I can walk upon some scenario in reality and everyone else is like, not much is going on. And I will see something that seems interesting to me and start talking about it. And before, before we know it, everything is sort of filling in and this, that, and the other thing. And the other, there can be that person is like, yeah, I don't really see much. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like universe rewards those who are imaginative and interactive participants, as opposed to just like consumers of, right. um, of the, the blank slate kind of thing. Um, but, uh, uh, I was on this hilltop in Uray, Colorado one time. And I was telling um, the person that I was with on a hike about some of these weird plasma cloud being things in the sky mm -hmm. and how like, it's weird. It's like, you can almost get into this thing with them where they will start responding to what you say. And just at that moment, one comes right up above us, Right. And I was like, watch, let's see. And I started talking about something, right? And it literally started like morphing and changing mm -hmm. into things that resembled what I was talking about. And she was like, this is a person who was like, maybe like easily paranoid. So she was almost a little, a little like made nervous or disturbed by it, right? Like she probably mm -hmm. would go to like, this is some sort of cloak surveillance craft kind of thing or something like that, right? But it, it was undeniable, right? So- right. So yeah, uh, I want to hear about dipolar holograms. I'm going to look that up and see if I can just get a quick. Well, I just made it up. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's see if Wikipedia has caught up with you yet. <laughs> you know, back in the day too, I had given a lot of attention to Dr. Stephen Greer, like when Google Video was was oh, going no. before YouTube, <laughs> and, and, and Dr. Stephen Greer with his like you know vectoring in you know aliens with the disclosure product. Oh, yeah. Let's see if anything grabs my... Let's look at this one. This is just a paper. We present experimental, experimental evidence indicating the formation of dipolar holographic gratings in potassium, lithium, tantalate, niobate at the paraelectric phase slightly above the phase transition. Well, how about that? Yeah. <laughs> I want to see if there's a picture. No picture. Um, I like when there's pictures, right? Um, okay, so continue with what you were saying about your um, your 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 your, your Stephen uh, Stephen Greer <laughs> experience. Yeah, uh, you know, I bought his book and I listened to a bunch of his testimonies, and that was back when I still believed in you know more of the materialist projection of the universe. Um, you know, I, I believed in the globe and NASA and all that stuff. But in 2008, I was um, I, I went to Tesla Tech and it mm -hmm. was really kind of cool. We got to go and look at these things that were flying in the sky with these Gen 3 infrared goggles. And they were hyper interactive, like with us. It was one of these things where it was like once you became aware of them, they became aware of you. And then that like brought me directly back to what my dad had taught me with, you know, local spirits. He's like, once you're aware of them, they're aware of you. There's like a, it's a two way street with that. So you can have some Loki like spirits that, you know, if there's a spirit that you're aware of that you don't want it to be aware of you, don't look at it. Don't actually give it attention because <laughs> they'll they'll start to mess with you like you'll have like the green man thing go on like you'll have a little gremlin and 
my dad was very tuned into that stuff. So when I saw these things in the sky, I was like, what, uh, this is sort of, this is just the spirit realm. Like I instantly felt ease. I felt like the whole star Wars thing and all this stuff about like these like aerial battles and everything like that. It was just actually just describing or it was like a materialist projection of what what's actually just ha happening on the more subtle level of things. And it was really cool. It kind of set me free in a way when I was watching all that. You know, I didn't have I didn't go into like, oh, my God, there's a secret space program and, you know, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> like it, I, went the, I went the other way. I was like, oh, oh, I, I get it. Like yes, this is the, the this is the secret is there's no space. It's just a program. <laughs> right. Right. So this gets to the the whole dipolar um or mul I I should call it multipolar hologram. So um I've only seen really simple holograms, and uh there's usually just one point source of light with these holograms, and the hologram will essentially shine light on an image and then it will hit a parabolic you know something shiny and reflective like a parabolic dish and then before you know it you can actually see the image and i've i've been i've been really wanting to have a model for what this realm is and i i <laughs> i saw this wonderful um video about the stereographic projection of this planet and what wouldn't you know it there's two poles but instead of a globe where you have a pole on the north and the south of the ball the 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 poles are like east and west and as soon as I saw that and saw like the the uh, Greenwich uh, mean which like date the, the where time like day starts with our system of 24 hours is like dead center. I was like, oh, my goodness, this looks like the two hemispheres of a brain. And so, of course, you know, when people talk about fractals, holograms are just three dimensional fractals, because for those of those out there that don't know. If you take any part of the hologram and and isolate it and take it out, that that part of the hologram contains the entire hologram within it, the entire photo or, or the entire image, I should say. And so I am a I'm a huge fan of uh, Rudolf Steiner. I'm a big fan of Kenneth Wheeler, a big fan of um this notion around what we know of as matter is essentially concentrated light. Like matter, like there's really only hydrogen. <laughs> and hydrogen is just like a very, very dense form of light. And light isn't a photon. Light is actually, as we know it, it's a coaxial circuit. And this gets to the whole thing with our eyes and how we perceive. Like the one thing that we don't understand is the way we actually perceive things, we actually don't perceive, we transceive. So we, we receive information and then we project information back. So there's always a current, there's always a loop current that's occurring. And so <laughs> this whole thing not to be too obtuse with the way I'm explaining it is essentially if God was to make a, a reality sim <laughs> simulation, he would use mul multiple uh, poles, let's say to actually project. Cause that would give for every pole of, of light that's projected within the circuit, you would have a greater intensity of reality. <laughs> and we're said to have live in a 3D reality, right? So the, the the stereographic projection of the of this plane has essentially three poles. It's so neat to see that. So I was like, huh, I wonder if each area of projection adds to the reality base. And then that's why there's this seeming interactivity, seeming fractality, 
and also a seeming solidity. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry to say that much. It, you know, it's the end of the Pis the Piscean season. So I had to let my my Pisces-ness <laughs> come out in full in full uh, array there. So yeah, no, I I agree with you. I think that the, a lot of people, and maybe this could be also like maybe it's the same people who are materialist, right? Um think that sort of the projection is one way, right? That there isn't back and forth, but mm -hmm. that I actually think that back and forth, that sort of like something projects something out, something else takes that in and projects back something almost as a response. And there's this constant sort of motion between those two things, right? That is the thing that is creating the reality as it is experienced. It's not just mm -hmm. a dictated reality we live in. Although people are always trying to push us towards that, whether they, you know, whether they recognize they're doing it or not. I just wanted to say, I found this paper that looks kind of interesting considering what we were talking about in the sky mm -hmm. in terms of like the arrays of, of metallic salts and, 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 and whatnot here. And this looks paper looks like it might be from the forties. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one, well, maybe this one's from 2007, but it's, it's quoting research from the, from the forties. And I thought that topic actually looked interesting. Some of the graphics looked interesting and it's a short paper. So maybe not too hard to understand. Um, but I, I oop, there we go. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. What is happening in the background there? Okay. I just wanted to see real fast. Um, I wanted to check something. Where did it go? I want to see if there's any photos of what dipolar hol hol holography would look like and see if there's any one of these images, maybe something that matches kind of what you're talking about, the way that you see it. Uh, look up stereographic uh, world map stereographic world map <laughs> there you go so in the search you you actually had it oh i had it yeah i see projection projection there it goes okay. so let me is it like one of these types down here yeah the guys on Awake Souls, they have a beautiful picture of it. Let me see. I had it over here. I've been geeking so hard on it with all this stuff. That's pretty interesting. All right, find me yours. I'm going to give you screen share so you can screen share if you want. Um, while you look for that, I'm just going to respond to what you were talking about as like the things in the sky, the sort of beings or whatever, like being uh, the spirit realm, right? Like even to the extent that there is any quote materials up there, right? Like the metallic salts or, or he heavy metal particulates or whatever. I think the the spirits or the energies that are attracted to them, it's like magnetism, right? Like certain, like if you ever watched, played um, Etch-A-Sketch or Magnadoodle when you were kind of little and you could drag the magnetic filings into some sort of shape, it's almost like the spirits or energies that resonate at the vibration that is attracted to that metal particulate were sort of gather around and create a swarm that then creates the entity or energy kind of look and movement and I've watched that in the sky in front of my face before where some of the like black particles will sort of right you know come together and whatnot so like even if it's different than the way one would necessarily think of spirit or spirit realm it, it's sort of being magnetized to the material that resonates sort of what that energy is right and and that's mm -hmm. interesting to um to 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 observe and what you were saying about interacting with the luminaries like that's one of the it's fascinating like if you get yourself out especially if you get yourself out into a place where there's not a lot of uh you know light or, or sound pollution like it's in, it's crazy the kind of like feedback you can start developing yeah. some of these bodies and i think one of the things that i most was most captivated by in terms of like the fpv angel material when i first started listening to them that like mm -hmm. 
was really interesting to get my head around is that the particle accelerators create the, the, the rainbows and some of the projections in the sky are the evidence of what's below. So it's creating some sort of like energetic feature in the sky that isn't sort of actually in the sky, but that that can interact with the things that are actually in the sky. So the bodies, the celestial bodies or stars or whatever that are there, the luminaries can mm -hmm. interact with the thing that is the projected thing. So, right. So they don't, it, it's that, so almost like something, something material can interact with something non-material as if it were a material thing and it's no different, right? Like it's, it, it was fascinating. It took, that's one of the things that took me the longest to get my head around. It's almost like, um, well, I guess it's like, if you, I, I mean, the, the hologram that I saw was like, Snoop Doggy Dog at Coachella, right? Mm -hmm. But it would be like if you could walk up to that hologram of Snoop Doggy Dog and interact and talk to that and get mm -hmm. an answer that was an answer to the question you asked, right? That right. that kind of interaction, not just like, oh, I feel like I'm walking next to Snoop Doggy Dog, but I know that I'm not because I can't actually talk to him. This would be being able to interact and exchange information despite the fact that like one thing is materially there and the other is not, right? Right, right. This all goes back to like the roots of the Vedanta Advaita and like you can get to a, a point in meditation where your pre-body, like your, your pre- your pre-experience like you're the experiencer and so you know there's this whole thing like experience and the experiencer they arise at the same time but yet you're there you're there even without experience there's some continuity there's some aspect of you that's a continuity and when you come into experience from, let's just say non-experience, at the most subtle level, you understand everything in the experiential realm is a vibration. It is an agitation. <laughs> it, it, it is this like, like if we're gonna use the analogy of the coaxial circuit, me as the observer, like I do have a, an animation that's occurring as I'm giving attention to something. There is an objective aspect to this that's outside. It's not like a singular projection, like you're dealing with other people's projections. And then you're dealing with the creator of this simulations, <laughs> big projection. But I think it's something that as you become more and more aware of the, the, let's just say it, the non-sticky stuff, like the stuff that has a lot of inertia. Like I love Ken Wheeler's description, like this is the plane of inertia. So inertia is that which slows down, that which wants to remain still. <laughs> so if you could say we have a coaxial circuit, let's just say our soul is like this billion watt light bulb and our eyes just dole out, let's say, a thousand watts a day. <laughs> you know, some of us dole out more light than others, but that light isn't a projection of photons. That light is an actual loop. It's a circuit with everything that's aware of. So it's not necessarily creating it because in this instance, in the hologram, you're not, you don't create anything. You're not, you're not the creator per se in the sense that like, oh, I made that because I'm aware of it. But it is the, the paradox. If, a, if there's no one in the woods to hear a tree fall, does it make a sound? Have you seen this television series? I just finished watching it called Counterpart. No. So in Counterpart, there is a, um, so there's a parallel universe there's another world, right? And the two worlds are connected through some location in Germany, in Berlin, that is like some kind of like UN or some kind of like embassy where there's mostly German people and American people. And then there's like seemingly some representatives from some other places, right? Mm -hmm. And 
as the series progresses, you understand how, like, this is the only connecting point. There's just this one connecting point, this one crossover point, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, as the series progresses, you find out, like, how this happened, that there used to just be one world, and then something happened on one day, and that made it so that there was two worlds, and then people from one and the other, everyone exists in both, and they start crossing, you know, certain people start crossing over, but only the people who are read in and whatever are aware that this other world exists. Most of the people in each universe or each world are not aware that there's another world in which there's another one of them that exists, right? Mm -hmm. And there are some differences between the worlds though, right? Like in terms of um, uh, like what the architecture looks like, what some of the technology is, what some of the biological and health concerns are. But at a certain point, you come to figure out that this whatever this breakthrough between the two worlds is it happened, it happened from a particle accelerator experience, right? Mm -hmm. But you, I think there's like this ongoing debate as to whether always the two worlds existed, right? And at this point, the there was a perforation and then they became connected or whether the particle accelerator sort of spun off a second world that was exactly the same, but from the moment there was awareness that they both existed, they started to diverge. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, and this is kind of like what, what you're talking about, I think, was there always the energy of like, there's this other world here that's waiting to be connected with, or did this idea that we could connect to another world cause us to perforate something that like created this other world did it get created at the moment of perforation or was it always there waiting to be penetrated and so from that moment so all these people the the people the few people that got to meet each other from the other side they're like they were the same person they were exactly the same up to one point and the only differences started to happen from the moment of perforation of connection and then their mm -hmm. life started to divert so was it one that split into two or was it always another world that was there but at a, you know but not having been connected yet it's kind of similar to the question you're asking right like with the observer like what you were saying with the observer observe or the experience experiencer like in the meditation right but like that the, mm -hmm. the, that moment you were talking about before the experience mm -hmm. right similar kind yes. of yes it, it it is similar. It's very interesting. Mark Twain's statement that he made, where you know, history doesn't repeat; it rhymes. Ah, and and you know, Nietzsche's whole thing that this is a circle that we endlessly go around and and, and re repeat the same thing. Like I'm not. I think there's some truth if you were to combine those two concepts and then understand the nature of what a holographic fractal would be experienced as. So there is no such thing as time. Like this right. realm of this realm of experience could be felt as an eternity. You like you could have the imaginal projection that you've had thousands of lives, and the imaginal projection, depending on <laughs> on how it refracts within the stereographic projection, within the stereographic you know holographic projection, the continuity that you call your soul would be like, oh, I've lived thousands of millions of lives and blah 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 blah, and have stories and all this other stuff. But in reality, it never happened because <laughs> reality is real. Reality, for something to be real, it has to be permanent. And one thing that we know about our experience, the biggest tell of our experience is everything is temporary. Everything is temporary. There's nothing that's permanent within our experience. So this is why the I love the quote from Jesus where he's like, you're in this world, but you're not of it. The aspect that loop current, that you know, billion watt light bulb that I say that has that, you know, interactive loop current, the uh, as you would call it, is a transceiver, not a receiver. 
that transceiver, that soul, that continuity, that is eternal. That doesn't, it, it, this plane of experience is, isn't that. This plane of experience is the inertial plane. So it's meant to make us feel like it's really real. And you could live billions of years of earth time, let's say <laughs> in air quotes, earth time. But that billions of years of earth time is nothing in eternity. And I'm not saying it's nothing in the sense that it's in comparison, but eternity is eternity because in eternity, there is not no time. Time is a, is a, is a measure of duration mm -hmm. for something that's temporary, but things that are eternal no have time. no, have yeah. no duration. Yeah. So, so we are these eternal beings, at least some of us, because I don't think everybody that's within the hologram is the same. <laughs> I could be wrong on that, but I don't think, and I'm not coming from like an elitist perspective when I say that. I'm just like, I've touched so many people where it's just like, oh, that's a different thing. Like that, that's a totally, that being in its own sovereignty is having a completely different experience. <laughs> right it's like when yeah. you're at a party and you see someone dancing and like not to be judgmental but you don't understand how they're possibly listening to the same track you're listening to <laughs> dude. dude i know like i remember my early dating days like when you like start kissing somebody where you guys just don't have it you're just like what is that like what is going on it's just like this whole other world so yeah from a from a spiritual perspective and by spirit, I don't want to sound lame. Like let's just say the most subtle aspect of ourselves, the most subtle aspect of ourself is our most powerful aspect of ourself because it actually does not reside in time. It's outside of time. And so it's the permanent component of us. The problem is it's hard to, as we're like engaging and transceiving in this, in this multipolar holographic fractal that we call life, we're like, oh yeah, that's real. And I'm important. And I'm identifying with this story and I'm identifying with that story. And these stories are so great. And I'm going to watch these things that engage my time and stuff like that. And there's an addiction that occurs with, with that whole thing. And so I think at, at a certain point, most, I'll speak for myself, like I have to get shocked out of the, the normal conveyance of, of the, of the hologram before I'm like, ah, oh, wait a minute. No, this is just something that's happening. Do and you... if it's, ha go ahead. go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I think you're going to finish what you're saying. So go ahead. And if it's happening, it's one, it's supposed to happen. Two, the body is going to do exactly what the body was programmed to do. Like it's going it, to, it's going to do its thing. And the best thing I can do in any situation is just give it my awareness, which is that transception, like that, that loop current. And the greater that I can give it that that full awareness that like as Eckhart Tolle would say, like that uh, moment of now, like the more you can like be aware of something without any story and just be aware of it as it is, for whatever reason, that's sort of the trick to the hologram. The hologram just ends up like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it it moves it moves on to the next projection it just it doesn't it it doesn't stay like if you can just be with things as they are without stories like the it's like the the frame rate of the hologram <laughs> just pushes everything through can you see my screen yeah so this is the this is the map from Ronnie and Jason, I think they're, it's the Awake Souls channel on okay. YouTube. So this is a stereographic projection. It, if people nowadays, I don't even know if how many people know what stereos are, but stereos are mean two channels. So our brain is a two channel 
device, um, left, left and right hemispheres. And so when, as soon as I saw this, I was like, whoa, this kind of reminds me of the brain, right? So you have both of these hemispheres and then like the center point, what we would call like the, the, the most Northern node would be the pineal gland. <laughs> and so, you know, if it is a holographic projection, the, the, the part contains the whole and the whole contains the part, but yet yep. you can, you can still have sovereignty within that. So this is an incredible map system because um, as they explain on their channel, it, it totally explains how a coordinate, it's the only accurate coordinate system that I've ever seen for the entire planet. And then that brought me back to my days with remote viewing. And like, that's one of the tenants in remote viewing is you don't, uh, you're never told a place's name. You're just given a coordinate. coordinate. Yep. And when you're given a coordinate and you're not, once again, you're not projecting a story onto it. You're like, oh, that's, you know, wherever. I know about that. They found that that was horrific. It didn't work. But if you had, you know, whoever... <laughs> whoever your rally car driver, you know, wingman was, is going, okay, the coordinate is 90 degrees north or 90 degrees west at, you know, 30 degrees north. And bam, they would find that the consciousness would go there. And that makes sense in this system. This, this whole grid that you see through here, this grid system is, it's, it's incredible because this green line in the middle is the Greenwich Mean Line. It goes right through Greenwich, England. And then as you go. I liked it better when you called it Greenwich. <laughs> <laughs> First you said Greenwich. <laughs> Greenwich. Yeah, I like Greenwich better too. I'm with you on that. But what's cool is these guys, the, their hypothesis is like the, this is the box that we live in. And like if you're over here in Hawaii, and you fly across through here, you literally go to like Mario Brothers or Asteroid, you go through the the wall of the hologram and then you come out over here. And so they explain they explain how the international date line, which is right on this line right here. This international date line, if you're heading from east to west, you lose a day and a half. And if you if you fly backwards in this system like let's say you fly from here and you pop out over here you gain a day and a half and how from a distance perspective that's impossible on on every single whether you're looking at a flat earth you know unipolar map like the david weiss system or you're looking at a globe nobody can explain this international date line and how that works and when you take the international date line and it bisects the Antarctica, and so this is this would be considered east, yeah. and this is west Antarctica. This would make sense how one um, what's his name when Cook talked about how he actually went around the entire um, Antarctica how it was like something like 51 or 52,000 miles. It so, would make, it would make sense within this coordinate system that that's what it, that's what it was. In any other system, it doesn't make like you talk to the flat earthers and they say, Oh, you're going around the circumference. And that's 52,000 miles. And the, the math doesn't add up. So getting back to like the, the, the holographic projection and how, the like the less materialistic way to look at it is like we have experience like we actually have experience physical experience but the physical experience isn't these billiard balls of 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 these solid things that are hitting each other like you could take the most ardent you know, scientists, that's a, that the, is the height of materialism. And they will admit to you that the majority of your body is empty space. Yeah. 
And so if the majority of all physical things is empty space, I mean, they've been telling us this forever. And it's one of the truisms. And it's like for every lie they tell you, they have to tell you some truth to kind of hook you in there, right? But what they tried to do was they tried to make light a material. They tried to say, okay, light is a photon. It's a right. particle. But it's not a particle. This is why I love the work of Kenneth Wheeler. And, the, you know, he's just on the backs of like all these other great scientists is like, Light is a, it, it's literally like if everything was one solid thing, what we are, have as an experience is just a gradient of, of charge within that medium that creates a gradient of perceived experience. But there really isn't and out there or in here or this or you know that's just all a, a that's all a perception so it's wild i'm 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 working on i have to write i have to write it out so that my brain is actually being having a, a logical progression to it but it really reminds me of my days of 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 deep meditation with vedanta advaita because there is like you are the fourth wall you are if you weren't here to witness it from your perspective it wouldn't exist so a couple of things um i, I wanted to comment on what you just said and then i want to go back to the way things proceed across this map and then also further back to something you said about you've touched enough people to recognize that not everything is the, the the same thing. So I want to hit those three. Stop your screen share so I can look at you and so we can chat. And also just noting that I'm not sure I know who Kenneth Wheeler is. So I'm going to look him up or look that up because I'm not familiar with I, I kept thinking it was a different Ken. But um, OK, so what you were just saying about the meditation as you were describing right before that, the experience with the light photons and whatnot. It's almost as if what people are thinking with the light, like being material and there being an actual object being observed is just the amount of time for the experience or prior to sort of project out sort of a thought or an idea or some sort of thing that comes to mind and for it to like have enough time to form into a complete idea to come back to them. And then they say they saw it. Right. Mm -hmm. Does that like, right. You know, cause when it you does. were talking, like that. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it's much more, it's like almost the process that humans or consciousness needs to go through in order to complete an idea or a thought, right. To have it like formed in a way that uh, makes meaning that like I'm generating something out and I'm getting something back is to sort of see it as like an externalized thing or object or interaction, as opposed mm -hmm. to just this back and forth that you're talking about are out and then and then returned with what seems like more information but it was really kind of all generated from that. I think this I think the, I you're you're on it and I think the 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 reason why it's like that why there's what we would call lag <laughs> is the lag is there because we have to be convinced that this is real for it to yes. be effective yes and that, that gives it enough time. It's like, okay, I, I, I imagined it well enough in those few minutes, seconds, hours, however long it is for a person. I imagined it well enough that it could be a real thing so then I can accept it as, as, as that. Right. And the, we're all here because we need to be here. <laughs> there isn't a mistake. Like for whatever reason, each soul has, it, it has its whole whatever it has to work through, whatever, whatever is deemed necessary. Uh, and so I, I won't even try to figure that aspect out for it. I know in my own life, I've come here to get better. <laughs> okay. So I looked up Kenneth Wheeler and the, I'm finding some kind of politician or something like that. So is there like a, is it normal spelling of Kenneth Wheeler? Go to YouTube. He's Theoria Apophasis. On I, feel YouTube. Like, I feel like somebody mentioned that to me yesterday. I've never heard of that before. And then I feel like someone said that yesterday. Okay. Theoria. Apophasis. Theoria. Ap okay. Got it. All right. Yeah. He calls himself a big fat 
bald monkey man. What? He has something like 7,000 videos on on YouTube. Gotcha. Okay. I see. Yeah, I got it. All right. So he, good. He wrote a book. It's kind of interesting. He lives in Kentucky and the person that trained me in magnetics uh, was from Kentucky also. A, a Dr. Floyd Sweet. Um, but he's a, he's a an absolute expert with everything to deal with uh, photography. And so in my days of trying to do free energy, whenever you get into the free energy world, you get into optics. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. You, you, and when you get start to get into optics, you start to get into this this whole thing called scalar interferometry which it means scalar interference geometry. And so I was like going deep down that path for about, you know, 10 years. And nobody could explain it to where it made any sense until I came across Kenneth Wheeler. And he started to talk about how he, is, he was essentially um, building on Tesla's work and he would pull out patents from Tesla and Faraday and all these guys. And he would actually show that like he was showing the science of optics. And when you get into high, high, high optics, which is one of the things that um, back in the day, Judy, Judy Wood and I talked about. When you get into really high level optics, it's freaky because there is no um, there 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 isn't such a thing as a photon. Um, I didn't know you talked to Judy Wood. She's a fascinating character. I didn't know you had spoken with her. Yeah, she she actually interviewed me for a study of hers because uh, I'm I'm a rare duck in the sense that I've been in the middle of a tornado and I've been in the middle of a hurricane. And so, oh yeah, she's very interested in the, both of those things. So for sure, yeah. Yeah, so we had a correspondence where I was describing my experience. I had actually been in the eye of, I think, three or four hurricanes in my life, but I'd only been in the eye of one tornado. And because um, she was studying the Hutchinson effect. Yep. And so in the Hutchinson effect, once again, we're like this kind of builds on what we were talking about earlier with this this uh plasmatic lensing you know that's what hutchinson was into was he would essentially create a, a plasma field where non-similar metals non-similar uh, materials would actually phase into each other and uh dr wood she had seen in all these different studies because i forget what military wing she had done studies for before she was at Clemson, but they had developed all the, the scalar weaponry on uh, scalar in, using scalar interferometry, this interference geometry where essentially depending on what type of electrical field was being created, um, you could, you know, let's say melt melt metal while keeping rubber that right next to it fully intact and where have we seen that yep so <laughs> so there's very similar effects with that with tornadoes or any of these uh huge storms that have very very low pressure is like in the middle of a low pressure zone um there's this magical effect that occurs there's almost like a levitational effect that occurs and, um, you know, in movies like, uh, what was that movie, Twister? They'll show like a piece of grass, like shooting through a wall. And they, what, they, what they're trying to do is make it seem like that's a materialist thing where it's just the sheer wind speed that's shooting that thing through the wall. But that's not it at all. What actually happens in these extremely low pressure zones, you get a dematerialization and a rematerialization. Mm-hmm. And so as being a conscious individual that actually got to experience that and got to witness the effects of that yep, in real time, I mean, do you want to hear that story? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> 
so it was really neat. My senior year in high school, we had a really good football team and I was, you know, I was like, I was pretty good at what I was doing and, but we had terrible weather. So pretty much for like four or five weeks, we only got to practice outside like two days a week and then we'd have our game. And then it, we just had just terrible weather in, in 1993 in South Florida. And then finally we got to go out. It was like mid season. I think we were undefeated at the time. We got to go out. It was like a sunny day. We're like, woo practice. So I'm out. I'm actually holding a football right now. So I was like, I was out there and I was in, in pre-practice, I'd always punt the ball to, to our star kick returner. He would catch the ball and then he'd, he would hand it to our quarterback and he would throw it back to me. So I was punting the ball and I noticed every time I punted the ball, it was perfect. Like the ball turned over. It was a perfect spiral every time. And then because I was punting it perfectly, they kept backing up and backing up. <laughs> but then I also noticed the guy that was catching the ball, he caught every single ball. And then I noticed that every time he would give it to my quarterback, my quarterback would throw the ball back to me. This is high school. The guy was like throwing the ball 55, 60 yards in the air. But I noticed how everything was easy. And then I looked across the field and I was watching my other players and it was like chariots of fire. They were <laughs> all just running like perfectly. It was like this beautiful, like everything was perfect. It was perfect, Emily. We were in, all of us were in the zone. Yeah. And it was just, it was just high school football practice that never in a bubble already that was getting ready for so so <laughs> i'm a, i'm just like i'm like in this and i'm loving it and by the way i'm like high as a kite like i did no drugs but my like the way i felt internally i was just like whoa everyone's beautiful i'm so good he's so good like everything's good next thing i hear is like i hear this whistling to the to the east and i turn and like we had those like you know portable classrooms that were in like yep. one field and i see i see our coaches like we're merging so they were like a good two football fields away but they're blowing their whistles and they're like all i could hear is get off the field and we're like i'm like no because it the weather it was like perfect and then i see my head coach and he's pointing up and i look up and we all do like this like look up and dude the funnel of the tornado was the exact diameter of the track that was around our football yeah track. yeah <laughs> and the thing was coming down like this and Dude, I get chills every time I think about it because we're like, we're out. So the second we break the seal of the track, we start to feel the wind. Yep. Inside, nope. there was no wind. Yeah. Talk about being in a bubble, right? <laughs> Dude, for reals. So we get by the time, and it was so stupid because our coaches were like, having us run to like an all metal weight room, you know, <laughs> like well, probably like the most dangerous place that we could have gone, but at least we were in the tornado. So by the time we get to the, we all do like a 250 yard sprint to the weight room. And we're like looking back and we see this. Ooh, like it sounded like the death star was powering down. Ooh, and like, it comes right to the track. And it didn't even touch the track. It just bounced. It went boom. It was so cool. The whole wow. funnel just bounced. It went boom. And then we watched it go right down Sunrise Boulevard, which was like the main thoroughfare from east to west. And like within 10 minutes, it was completely sunny sky. It was like nothing ever happened. Wow. Yeah. So she was just interested in sort of that, the phenomenon of, of like what it felt like in that sort of energy field during that time. Or what was she, what were her questions for you about that? 
She's a person I'm some I'm semi fascinated with. Yeah. Right? She's very analytical. Yeah. Um she's very analytical. She when she was talking to me, she was actually really happy that she was talking to somebody that kind of believed her. Right. <laughs> Cuz I think this is like 2010 or 2011. Yeah. I um and our correspondence was kind of brief. I told her and then we talked about it and she was just wanting to know, like she was, she was very happy to hear the whole thing I said about how everything was perfect. Right. It, it kind of mirrored like the hurricanes that I've been in. Cause in Florida, the storms come because it's such shitty energy mm -hmm. without this, without the storms, mm -hmm. there's so much transient, you know, anger and like just, it's such a potpourri of different people there that are are going through so much stuff that the storms come in. And when the storms come in, they clear out all of that negative energy. And so uh, we always loved when hurricanes came because that's when everybody would start to be nice. You know, yeah. se seriously, because like people come down from New York and New Jersey and it's just like, you know, they're they're bringing all that like hard you know northeastern energy down to the southeast and it's not really appropriate the hurricanes come and then everybody kind of forgets and they, everybody kind of takes care of each other it's it's a really beautiful thing because people really in every disaster situation i've ever been a part of people actually shine right they, they, yeah they, you, they don't worry about who you voted for and whatnot then right no so, wait so it's interesting because if you recall the tornado was the sort of uh, organizing principle of the story of the Wizard of Oz. Yes. Right. So, and I think Judy Wood even acknowledges that when she sort of gets into her narrative about, you know, about this, mm -hmm. right. And how, how, how important the Hurricane Aaron was to what happened on, yes. on 9 11. So, okay. I want to do, um, we're just a few minutes after five. I want to, um, there's a couple of things I wanted to, to, to talk about with you. I think I'm going to skip over two of them for now, but we'll <laughs> the second hour. Well, I was going to ask you about like, on that map you showed, I was going to talk about the little procession thing across it, but I think I'm going to let that go as well as the, what touching people who you're like, Oh, this is not the same thing means. I think we'll shelf mm -hmm. that for another day. I want to go into the, the, the patrons hour. And I want to talk to you actually a little bit more about Judy Wood. I never, and I, that was the last thing on my mind that we would talk about today, but since it showed up, let's talk about it. And then I do want to talk about um, a few things that, that came up over the course of the first hour. And that was point of view, perspective and optics. Mm -hmm. And like what I have been really thinking about quite a bit, both in like my normal mental space, but then also in like sort of my uh, exercise high or even psychedelic mind space a lot. And that has to do with like each person's unique lens of perspective or perception um, in, in relation to that. Um, and then maybe also talk a little bit about this thing that you've been wanting to talk about, about building a, an orgone accumulator uh, as a living space, I mm -hmm. would prefer to build an organ accumulator as a dancing space, maybe than a living space. So maybe we can hash that out <laughs> and the other side as well. Great. So we're going to move over there. You get people can go to patreon.com forward slash off planet media, emilymoyer.locals.com or rockfin.com forward slash emilymoyer to catch the rest. And before we go, let people know what you're up to other than this and where they can find you. I'm uh, building and designing dome homes. Uh, we have just launched TopherHQ.com. I have a podcast on there that I, I get to talk to great people like Emily all the time. And uh, the purpose of the podcast is, is so I can build a curriculum for my daughter mm. and, and any other children um, that we might have in our life. And the whole notion is, is like, it's, the subtle controls the gross. The, the, the most macro we can get, if we can get that bird's eye view to look back and look down and like see the whole thing, that kind of puts things in context. 
and then it allows us to relax. <laughs> and so, um, and then it also, the one thing that the podcast is there to do is sort of exercise the demon of naivety mm. <laughs> too. So, but not do it in a like, you know, be scared way. It's just sort of like, ah, oh, okay. We have enough, enough wonderful perspectives to be like, okay, this is, this is the view of, of life. And you can see in the, the, the structures that I build and the people that I massage on Topher HQ, you can just kind of see that there is a real love for life. And then there, there's a, there's a, uh, there is a charisma. Uh, my, 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 uh, podcast is the bio charisma podcast and um yeah toferhq.com that's where you can and you also it. create biochar so everything is all connected <laughs> yeah yeah and i'm actually looking on doing that at a commercial level because uh, at first i thought i was just going to build machines for people but uh people just want the product yeah people don't want you <laughs> people are just like give me the stuff man all right we will see you guys on the other side thank you chris <laughs>